Well, I'm, I'm very excited today to have Beth Payne joining us. Uh, Beth was uh, one of my participants in a workshop I just did down in Cuba last month, and, uh, and it was right at the beginning of the virus scare. Uh, actually, we were there right when, the, uh, when President Trump declared the national emergency, and, uh, and it was a little bit of a hairy time there. And, and uh, she has worked for the State Department for years and has retired. Uh, unfortunately, had some contacts at the embassy in Havana and really helped calm our nerves while we were there. Uh, we, we, thanks to her suggestion and, and input, we got out a couple days early and, and uh, it, was, it was a wise, wise move. But uh, Beth uh, uses her photography to help with uh, getting through tough times. And she's been through some... <laughs> She's been through some shit, as I like to say. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really, really excited. Uh, she does this resilience tra training, uh, set it up for the State Department, and uh, does a lot on her, has her own company now doing this. And it's really great of her to give us her time to do this. So uh, maybe I could have done a better introduction, Beth. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, so here's Beth. and. Uh, if you have questions for her throughout, you can ask or wait till the end. So take it away, Beth. Thank you, Lauren. That was great. That was a great introduction. And I really was excited to have this opportunity to um, put together two of my greatest passions, photography and resilience. And in putting this talk together, realized how important photography has been to my own resilience. And just to give you some background, um, I started creating photographs when I was a teenager. I luckily had a dark room in my junior high school and the magic of a dark room really sold me on photography. But like many people, as I got older, I kind of let my hobby wane a little bit. I joined the State Department in 2003 and I was much more focused on work and travel and really, you know, didn't pick up the camera very often. Then in uh, 2000, um, I joined the Foreign Service in 1993. In 2003, I was sent to Iraq uh, when we invaded and I opened the office of the US Consul in Iraq. And it was pretty frightening. It was kind of deadly. And in October of 2003, my hotel, the Al Rashid was heavily bombed. Um, about 20 rockets hit the hotel. And luckily for me, the rocket that hit my room did not explode, but it was pretty terrifying. And as I was leaving the hotel, a colleague was screaming for help and I had to go back and help her at risking my life, not knowing what was going on and filled with smoke. It was pretty horrific. And I stayed in Iraq after that, despite the trauma of living through that rocket attack and helping my colleague and really dealt with a lot of death and a lot of danger. And when I left Iraq, I took the wonderful gift of post-traumatic stress disorder with me and spent the next two years really struggling with what, was, what had happened to me. I really didn't know what was going on. Luckily, found a great therapist. And surprisingly for me, part of her therapy was for me to get back into my photography. She understood that art therapy is very effective for individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder. And in fact, there's a lot of research now on the value of art therapy and specifically photography for people recovering from mental illness, um, particularly post-traumatic stress disorder. So I bought a digital SLR. I took a class because I couldn't shift easily from film to digital and jumped right back into photography and photography became a pretty integral part of my recovery. Um, then, I started looking into resilience because I wanted to help other US diplomats not go through what I went through. I wanted to see if there was a way I could have protected myself um, before going to Iraq and not had gotten post-traumatic stress disorder or maybe had bounced back sooner um, rather than going a few years really struggling. And so I immersed myself in resilience research, worked with a team of individuals at the State Department and developed resilience training skills and tools for fellow US diplomats. And in that discovered how integral photography is to developing resilience and also discovered that resilience isn't just for high threat environments like Iraq. 
And of course, the last few months have shown that. All of us experience difficulty and trauma in our lives, whether it's the loss of a loved one, um, whether we're in a car accident or the whole world right now is experiencing this global pandemic. And resilience is what helps us get through. And really the, the definition of resilience is pretty twofold. We want to be able to adapt successfully during the trauma, during the risk and adversity. We want to be able to perform well. We want to be able to live during this global pandemic in a way where we can still get things done. We can get our work done. We can still enjoy our lives. And we're not, you know, there's, there's not harm being caused. But, you know, we are, we are going to have some setbacks. I mean, especially going through what we're going through now, you know, I may not be as good at the end of this crisis as I was before the crisis. And resilience helps us bounce back fully and quickly, if not bounce forward after setbacks. And so now, after I fully recovered from post-traumatic stress disorder, I actually consider that I bounced forward after the trauma of working and living in Iraq. I'm actually a better, more capable, more grounded person than I was before I left for Iraq. And so when you think about resilience, it's really a state of being. Some of us may be born more resilient than others, but it's how resilient am I today, depending on what's happening around me and what's happened to me. And the best way to prepare for anything is to stay with high resilience as often as possible. So I look at resilience as green, yellow, and red. When we have high resilience, we're in the green, where we can function in the presence of risk and adversity, we can bounce back quickly and fully. But you know, depending on what happens to us, we may erode and our resilience becomes you know, a lower level of resilience, which makes us vulnerable to mental health disorders. Um, when we're in the red, we need help from a professional. We need a professional a mental health uh, care provider to help us move back up to the green, which is what happened to me. But when we're in the yellow, there's a lot that we can do to get back up into the green. And again, I learned this personally because I started with the State Department in 1993. I served in pretty dangerous places. Um, you know, Kuwait, we had the risk of a second Iraq invasion where I thought, you know, we're not gonna live through the week. I was in Israel during several bomb uh, terrorist attacks and in Rwanda after the genocide. And so over the first 10 years of my career in the State Department, my resilience was just slowly coming down that, that scale. And I would bounce back a little bit, but not bounce back fully. So that by the time I left for Baghdad in 2003, I was probably in the low green or the high yellow. And that really made me vulnerable so that when I was in that rocket attack and I was there for almost a year of danger and uncertainty, that's when I slipped into the red and I needed to have a therapist help me move back up. So how do you know you're in the yellow? Um, well, I looked at lots and lots of assessment tools. There are a lot of people out there doing tools where I can take 20 questions and it'll tell me where I am. And I wasn't happy with any of these tools because one, we're not gonna take a 20 question questionnaire every day to tell us where we are. Instead, I looked at what are the characteristics that we see when our resilience is low. And so on the screen, you'll see these are very common characteristics of low resilience. And you wanna learn your own behavior so that you can see when you're slipping into the yellow. So for example, for me, I have trouble sleeping and I get irritable when I'm slipping into the yellow. And I look for those indications and it tells me, well, I need to do something to move back into the green. Other people may drink more, that's the risky behavior, or they'll lose their memory, or they'll get really cynical and not care anymore, a lack of hope. Um, moodiness is very common, um, a fear, anger, constant illness, and in fact, resilience. When we're in the yellow, our immune system is depressed, and it's easier for us to catch viruses and bacteria that's around us. So actually staying in the green keeps your immune system up and could be a protective factor even now during this health crisis. That another reason why you wanna stay in the green as much as possible because you're less likely to get sick from a virus that's, that's around you. 
And so each of us respond differently. So you may experience different behaviors than I would, but getting to know your behaviors is critical because you want to be able to tell when you're in the yellow so you know to take some action. So at the State Department, we took a lot of resilience research and we mixed it with a lot of wisdom from experienced successful US diplomats and developed this model of five factors for how to go from yellow to green or how to stay in the green. And I'm gonna address each one of these factors and explain how photography actually helps you foster every one of the five resilience factors. It's why photography as a, hob as a hobby is like great for resilience. And in fact, I would love to do a study someday of photographers and just see how much more resilient we are than the average population because this hobby is so, so good at addressing these five factors. So the first factor is self-care. And this is so simple. It's you know eating properly, it's sleeping seven to nine hours a night, it's exercising. But the fourth aspect of self-care is what a lot of people forget. And it's recovery. It's taking time to rest your brain. You know, when we're sleeping, we're cleaning up certain chemicals in our brain. We're actually getting rid of some pretty um, toxic proteins in our brain. But we need to also rest our brain when we're awake. We want to focus on only one thing at a time, and it calms everything else that's happening in our brain. And of course, the most popular way to do that is meditation. That's why meditation and mindfulness has become such a big deal these days, because meditation forces your brain to focus on one thing at a time and therefore is resting your brain and giving your brain time to recover. So I lived in India for three years and I cannot meditate to save my life. Every few years I give it another try and I'm always unsuccessful. <laughs> so I started to look around for what else could rest my brain. What forces me to focus on one thing at a time? And of course you know what it is. Photography. When you are photographing and you are looking through that viewfinder, you're focusing your brain, you're resting it because you're really looking at what's around you and forgetting everything else that's happening in your life. And it's a very, very powerful way to rest your brain. Any type of arts and crafts and painting and singing, all of this rests your brain. But photography is one of the best ways to rest your brain. And it's so interesting because when I feel myself getting into the yellow, I make sure I carve out time on the weekend to photograph. Like if I've had a pretty stressful week, I'll spend a couple of hours on the weekend photographing. Um, because you, you need that time for the recovery. In fact, I no longer photograph only when I have time left over at the end of a week. I actually schedule time to photograph because it's such a powerful recovery tool. Any questions on self-care and photography as a method of resting your brain? You know, I just want to say I know exactly what you mean because when I'm doing photography, I feel so focused. I feel like I'm in the zone and nothing else around me is getting my attention. So I know exactly what you mean. Thank you. And that is exactly it. And that's how meditators describe their meditation. You don't have to learn to meditate. Your photographers just go out and photograph. Thank you. Now I know why I want to do it. I can't understand why I was focusing so much on it, but it put me in a good place. Good, good. And you'll see there are even four more reasons why you want to be doing it. And so the next uh, fact, oh, go ahead. Um, what about uh, editing your photographs? Do you find that relaxing? Or I mean, I do, but I'm a programmer, but I'm just curious for your take on that. Yeah, so that can also, because you're focusing your brain, you're only editing, you're not thinking about anything else. Your brain doesn't have space to ruminate. So yes, editing also helps. So the next factor is active problem solving. So those of us who are good active problem solvers tend to have higher resilience. And there are lots of active problem solving skills and tools. For example, one is the ability to say no. Um, when you're able to say no, you're freeing up time 
to do things that are important to you and that are priorities for you, and that keeps you in the green. But my favorite problem solving tool is called the sphere of control. And it's basically in our lives, we can either control something, influence it, or we have to accept it if we can neither control or influence. And acceptance does not mean acquiescence. It's just, I accept that this is something I can neither control or influence, and therefore I stop trying to change it, or I stop, I stop ruminating about it or thinking about it. Well, photography actually teaches us to accept what we can't control. I mean, I can't control the, the sunlight. I can't control whether it's cloudy. I can't control whether it rains but I can control my camera settings. I can control whether I bring the right lens or tripod. I can focus on being creative given the situation I have found myself in. And learning to do that is actually training your mental muscles. So we've trained ourselves to accept what we cannot control and to adapt and focus on what I can control. So if it's low light, I can control my camera settings. I can't bring the light back. I can't turn the light on. If I'm in bad weather, I'm gonna change my creative approach because I can't, I have to accept that it's raining. So you can apply this tool that you've learned naturally as photographers to the rest of your life. I accept that there is the coronavirus and it's here in DC. I, I don't dwell on it. I don't obsess over it because I can't influence whether it exists, but I can control how I spend my day and I can influence the people around me. So any questions about the sphere of control and how photography teaches you how to accept what you can't control or comments? Okay, it's, so it, it's true. You just have to accept it. I so agree. So as more you say it, as more, it's kind of like confirming, <laughs> <laughs> isn't it? And you and you're thinking back now when you're photographing, you're like, right? I had to just accept that you know, it was yeah. a cloudy day. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but it also helps you not only accept it but deal with what's been handed to you. You know, it's like. I've seen so many people, you know, everybody has a different level of photography and they take different types of pictures. Some people like a soft focus, a sharp focus, you know, so many different styles. Our brains are all wired differently. So what we accept is what works for us, you know, that gets us to that path of resilience, like what you're saying. Absolutely. And it's amazing. You get the best photographs when you accept what is. I think and also on what you control, you create beautiful photographs. I think also it's not just about accepting, it's about adapting. Yeah. Yep. Because when you accept what is, you then adapt more effectively because you stay in control of your own behavior. But if you won't accept what is, you keep trying to change something you can't control and you become less adaptive. Right. And I also want to add, even though you really, you, know, you haven't talked about it, but I think people who are even below the yellow, into the red or orange, whatever that thing is, it could also help them also. Absolutely. To be honest, a lot of these tools are taught as cognitive behavioral therapy as well by professionals in a little bit more intense way. Absolutely. So, so, the next, oh, so I, I see problem solving as bigger than this. I'm not sure why you're calling this problem solving. So this is an active problem solving tool there are lots of skills and tools that are problem solving. I don't have time to teach them all to you today. Yeah. If you go to my website, you will see other examples of problem solving skills and tools. By, so, the, way, by the way, I'm a physicist. Yeah, there you go. And okay. so you'll see, I'm, pre I'm choosing the one, one I like, the sphere of control a lot, and two, it's related to photography. Okay. But there are lots of different problem solving tools. And so the factor is active problem solving. If you are a good active problem solver, you will tend to be more resilient than people who aren't. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. So the next factor is having a positive outlook. And again, there are lots of different aspects to this factor. 
Um, gratitude, there's a lot of research on showing gratitude and appreciation, how that makes us more resilient. Um, just humor and laughter makes us more resilient. But the tool that photography is teaching us is reframing. And so reframing, the ability to reframe is basically taking something that is negative and looking at it in a more positive light. As human beings, we constantly scan the world for negativity. If we didn't, we wouldn't have survived in the wild. The lions and the bears would have gotten us. So we're always scanning the world for negativity. And negativity sticks with us. Our brains will actually remember the negativity more than the positivity. It's like Velcro. And negativity is contagious. And so if I walk in a room and there's a really negative person there, I might catch some of that negativity. But if we stay in negativity all the time, it's going to erode our resilience. And again, with the, with the health crisis, it's really tempting to just kind of really like focus on the negativity and watch all the bad news. And before we know it, at the end of the day, we're like drained and tired and we can't think straight. So that's just an example of how negativity will erode resilience. What reframing does is it, it doesn't suppress the negativity. We still acknowledge the negativity, but then we look at it differently. We look at it through a different frame. And so we're reframing all the time when we're photographing. I mean, we're gonna look at a scene and say, you know, that scene just doesn't speak to me. Let me step back. So I'm gonna take a longer term view of something or let me go forward and do a macro view, look at it more closely. Or maybe I'm just gonna go to a different angle. I'm gonna view this scene from several different frames until I can create the most appealing photograph. You know, it's, it's working the scene. So reframing mentally is the same. We're gonna work the scene. So the way I reframe sometimes with the coronavirus, I work the scene. I step back, I say, well, let me take a longer view. Well, you know, we went through this in 1918 and our country did fine. We recovered fully. In fact, we had the roaring 20s. And so maybe, you know, will the same will happen to us this time? Or I ask myself, could anything positive come from this? Well, I'm spending more time virtually with my family. You know, we're having virtual happy hours. We never did this before. And so I'm becoming closer with family as a result. And so I'm looking at the negative situation, which it is, you know, we're struggling with this health crisis from different angles and different frames to see it in a much more positive light. You don't want to have unrealistic positivity and you don't want to pretend that there's nothing negative. You just want to look at it differently so you get the most appealing frame possible. And again, this is one example of a positive outlook skill. And you're learning this as photographers. Any questions about reframing and positive outlook or comments? So you're turning the negative into a positive. Yes, absolutely. And you have to consciously think about doing that because your natural tendency would be to stay in the negative and you want to consciously shift it towards a more positive view. This is great stuff. Thank you. I'm a, a paramedic in Jersey. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, you know, it's, there's not a lot of positive right now. Yes. So even reframing for that's tough. And there is one danger in reframing. I'm glad you mentioned that. So you don't want to reframe grief. So when my mother passed away, reframing was not the tool to use because there was no way in grief that I wanted to do reframing. Also, you don't want to reframe for other people. It can feel dismissive and patronizing. You can ask people reframing questions, but you don't want to do it for them. So this is a tool when used well in the right situation can be incredibly powerful, but if it's not used well, so if you're grieving, if you're dealing with death and loss, don't use reframing, use something else. But if you're dealing with, wow, you know, I, I'm, I'm working from home because of this coronavirus, or I can't see my friends and I can't go out to dinner, then reframing is incredibly valuable and a very effective tool to use. 
Yeah, I, I think uh, I've been thinking through much of this about children and those who are especially living in poverty and are dealing with such dire circumstances now. Um, and sometimes it's extremely difficult for them to reframe and find something positive in their lives to think about. I know educators are having a really, really hard time now reaching out to these kids, many of whom can't even do the remote learning they're expected to do because they don't have the resources. Right. So, it, I mean, we have to address this and we just have to know as a society, this is something that we need to consider when we're working with people, like I said, especially children living in poverty. And you know, it's interesting, there are several nonprofit organizations that give cameras to children who are refugees or children who have survived really terrible trauma. And again, because of these points that I'm mentioning, they're not teaching per se reframing, but the kids are learning reframing from photography. And so they're learning all of these skills and tools through using a camera to create their stories. And I do think it's why these are such powerful programs where we give children, you know, cameras and it's, it's really beneficial to them to learn photography. Do you know if there's any research on that? I have not found research on it yet. Yeah, I'd love to see some and share it with. with yeah, <laughs> I would love to see someone do research on it. I think it would be great. Thank you. So the next uh, factor is meaning and purpose. And some of you may recognize Viktor Frankl. He wrote Man's Search for Meaning. Um, he was a German psychiatrist who was imprisoned in Auschwitz during the Holocaust. And while he was in Auschwitz, he studied his fellow prisoners and determined that people who had meaning in their lives that maintained meaning, even such a horrible, horrible situation, tended to survive. And when a prisoner lost meaning, they tended to pass away. And so their physical abilities didn't determine whether they lived or died. Meaning had more impact on their ability to survive such horrors. And so he wrote about it in Man's Search for Meaning. And we find meaning and purpose in many areas in our lives. It can be through our family, our work, through religion, by helping other people. Um, but also having a passion for something can give you meaning and purpose. And so I have a passion for photography. I'm passionate about photography. I watch instructional videos. I take classes. I read books. You know, I care about photography. I follow photographers. And that gives me meaning in my life. It fills something in my life. And you really want to have meaning in at least two, if not three or four areas of your life. Because meaning's like a stool. If you only have like two legs of a stool and one leg gets broken, your stool's gonna topple. But if you have four legs in a stool, even if one gets broken, your stool's gonna stay solid. So you wanna find meaning in several different places. Um, this became very clear to me in the State Department because too many of us who work as, in the Foreign Service find meaning only in our work. And I was doing that my first 10 years. I was so focused on work. I was kind of not spending time with my family and I didn't have time to volunteer and I'm not religious. And so all my meaning went into work. Well, that's a very insecure place to be. And so photography gave me a second area of meaning and I reached out to my family and realized, oh my God, yes, I need to spend more time with family so that I had three legs of the stool um, instead of just one. And so, you know, being passionate about photography gives you an enormous meaning in your life. Any thoughts or questions about meaning and purpose? And about I agree with you on that because I know there were times in past jobs where stress was just totally unbearable. It was really mm -hmm. bad but it, I was coming up to a photography trip or, you know, something like that. And it was amazing how within just a day, I was a totally different person. That stress was gone. 
and I just felt so rejuvenated. So not necessarily just because it's photography, but it's like what you're saying, that third leg, that's something else to refocus your brain onto something less stressful. I mean, right now, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I was probably at the very low end of resilience, but I started out placement because I lost my job. I've been mm -hmm. editing photos, posting a photo a day on Facebook. So it's just that, that meaning, I feel like I have purpose again. Like I'm here for a reason and I'm doing something that's helping me. Oh, that's such a great example. Thank you so much. I'm also thinking that sometimes while doing the photography gives meaning and purpose to us, the things that we're actually photographing might have meaning themselves or might illustrate purpose themselves. And so we may be thinking about that while we're doing the photography, which I think adds another layer of meaning and purpose to our lives. Absolutely, I love that. I know that, you know, I have been posting some pictures, but I've been balancing them. Some are maybe of, I live in New York City, so of Park Avenue with no cars, no people. But then I temper it with a second picture that I'll post, which might be of birds in Central Park, something uplifting, or a nice picture of Washington Square Park last summer of people skateboarding in the park and people just looking happy. Mm -hmm. Because that helps me, but it seems that when people are looking at it, they seem very pleased and it makes them feel a little balanced also. So it's documenting what's going on now but also something hopeful. And I love that through our photographs, we can help other people by either giving them some joy or some thought or some understanding of a situation because helping other people is also a way to bring meaning and purpose into your life. Just a question, what do you say um, you know, to people when they say, well, gee, I really feel the resilience when taking pictures um, but then I come home and I, you know what I mean? And then it's like, uh-oh, here we are again in the middle of all this, you know, the, the pandemic. How do you, you know, what do you say to people to, to, to get them to keep that resilience going? So here's the challenge with resilience. If you are in a structural situation where you are living in chronic stress, or maybe you're working in a toxic work environment, or there's just so much stress at home, Resilience will maybe keep you in the yellow, but it's rare that you'll make it to the green. And so in those situations, you have to change the structure in order to remove the chronic stress. Resilience is great for a crisis like what we're going through because we know, you know, this isn't gonna last for years. But if you're in a situation at work or at home where there is just constant chronic stress, you need to use some of those active problem solving skills. And like there's something called the five whys getting to the core of a problem of finding what's really going on here, what's causing this structural problem that's causing chronic stress. And I need to fix that. I need to change it. So for some people it's quitting their job. I mean, I would recommend to anybody in a toxic work environment to use problem solving skills to find a way out because you will rarely, you know, you can't be green when you're in a toxic work environment. Um, you, you have to work so hard to stay in the yellow. And that's really, really hard because you've, you've got to change your environment in order to be able to get to the green because it's not just what you're doing to stay resilient, it's also the environment in which you're living. Hey Beth, one, one thing that that I just want to share. When my dad was very ill with lung cancer, it went on for five years. And I was the lead medical, you know, person that helping with the family, dealing with all the medical doctors, this and that. I didn't have time not to be resilient. But after he passed away, like six months later, man, did I crash. I crashed big time. There's only so long you can keep up that, that farce. Because eventually, and it wasn't the grieving of his passing, it was just, I just crashed. I had nothing left. There wasn't an ounce left of anything. So this is incredibly common. We saw this in the State Department all the time. And it's really what leads to burnout. 
It's that we're under chronic stress and we can get through it. We can, we can shore ourselves up and dig deep into those energy reserves in order to do what needs to be done. And six months, one year, sometimes even two to three years later, we crash and burn because we haven't taken the time to recover. We haven't recognized that we're, we, we've worn ourselves out, but then we've gone back to life as usual. And you need to take time after you've been through a period of high stress. And when this crisis is over, we all need to take the time and then actively foster these five factors to get yourself back up. Otherwise, you will, you'll crash. That's, that's what happened to me. It was really two years after I left Iraq that I was crashing. You know, I could keep it together for two years, but not longer. And so recognize that just because you got through it at the time doesn't mean you're okay and that you can just go back to life as normal. You need to recover. Um, if you're looking at a situation like a chronic, uh, a, a tough work environment, yeah. um, that's something that's continual. That's not a traumatic one time only. Yes, you can recognize it. Many times, I don't think that we can even recognize we're in a toxic environment. We just do whatever we can to manage it. So how then do you, because uh, I know I've been there and if I look back, I'm like, what made me deal with that for so long? So how do you really, I, I had to train myself to get there, but it took time. Is there a shortcut to uh, getting to see that that's a tough environment for you? So I, I would say the fifth, the fifth factor, the social support, will help you because you almost need someone else and that's what happened. to Somebody. help you see that you're in a toxic work environment. That's exactly what happened. So one of the things I do for people is I help toxic I help people in toxic work environments see the reality of their environment and I help them make decisions about how to move forward. Um, if you go to my blog, you'll see a blog on how to survive a toxic work environment. If you, have, if, if you decide that you can't leave, you have financial reasons or other reasons why, you can survive it, but you won't thrive in it. Right. If you can leave, it's really, really important to leave. And you almost need another person yeah. to be your reflection and to help you see because toxicity, it's, it's like domestic violence. Like until someone points it out to you, you don't really know what's happening. You don't see it. You just get used to it, to the abuse. And you, you really need other people to say, that's not okay. Like that's not normal. And that's where social support, that's why social support is one of the five resilience factors. We need people in our lives. We cannot live solo lives. And we need physical, people physically in our lives. And that's why now is so hard because many of us, you know, I live alone. Um, I'm seeing people virtually, but it's still not the same as having somebody physically with you. We need a social support network. It's why I really love Meetup. And again, photography. What a great way to meet people. Like, when, when I went to India, I knew no one. I had no friends in India and I was too senior. I, I ran the consulate, so I couldn't be friends with any of the Americans that worked for me because that, that wouldn't have been appropriate. So I, I just hooked up with all these photographers and we started a photography club and all they cared about was photography. So they didn't even care that I had the power to give visas. Um, we never talked visas, we talked lenses. and camera bodies and you know went out creating beautiful photographs and they became my social support at a time when honestly I had no other social support. I really, really depended on that photography group to provide the friendship and the support and the social connections that that I really desperately needed. And so again these meetups are great, you know, trips like the one I just took to Cuba with Lauren where you meet new people and you have shared interests in photography, that's how you build those social networks. And then those people that you see regularly at every meetup become friends. And those friends can tell you, well, the situation you're describing at work is not normal. You know, let's talk about that. Are you sure you want to stay there? Are you sure that's good for you? And so, I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled that this is, of course, a meetup, a uh, virtual meetup, but this is really, really good for you, especially if you move to a new city or, you know, you just, you're getting lonely. 
And you know, there's a loneliness epidemic in, in the Western world and Western culture. There's more research being done on this. It especially affects older men um, who often do not have friendships, that they depend on a spouse for all their social support. And that's not healthy. You can't depend on just one person for social support. Um, women in America, we are socialized to build social networks. So we're, we're a little luckier in that it's, it's socially promoted for us to build groups, but it's really very difficult for men. And in fact, men in America and Britain, there's a bit of a crisis, especially older men. So again, this is where photography can help you to build those social networks and social support at a time when you're at risk of not having anyone to support you, um, especially as you're older. So any thoughts or questions on the social support? No, but I've been thinking about people who are in abusive relationships because so many of them don't want to, they, they keep it a secret. So they're not building honest, social supports and it's from, from what i understand it's extremely difficult for them to um, reframe or feel like they have any control or think positively you know about anything they they just they can't do it so I, and, I and you, you know why the abuser actually breaks all their social connections so the technique for an abuser is to sever all their ties with other people because they're, they're taking away that resilience factor that keeps them stronger in order to weaken them. I've even seen this in totalitarian countries. Um, because I was State Department, I did resilience training all over the world. And I did resilience training in some dictatorships and realized that the leader would actually minimize all five of these factors, would do things intentionally to make it hard for people to foster their resilience. And that just meant they had to work even harder to, to prevent that from happening. Um, because if you're not resilient, I can, I can control you more easily. I can influence you more easily if your resilience is really low. But when you're in the green, you're gonna fight back. You're gonna stand up for yourself. You know, you're, you're really powerful when you have high resilience. Um, so it's interesting, abusers will cut off the social support on purpose. Hi, this is Matthew, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, another wonderful aspect I found about uh, photography is it attracts a very diverse community. Uh, not only, you know, the obvious, you know, ethnic diversity, socioeconomic diversity, but people who come from different life experiences, uh, you know, and uh, it's a very, very easy, uh, I don't want to call it a hobby, a passion, whatever you want to call it, to get into, you know, you don't have to study it for years and years. You could basically just pick up a camera and go out and shoot. And I've met so many wonderful people who are very different from me, and that's good for me, you know, to get exposed to. And, um, you know, I think that enhances a lot of social support because it's amazing just to see how, you know, different people interpret things different ways. And I think photography really brings that out. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think there's much more um, balance. There's a lot more gender balance, a lot of different ethnicities and nationalities and age groups. And honestly, I know I'm biased, but I think photographers are some of the nicest people I've ever met. Like I won't go on a trip with strangers, you know, normally, but I will go on a trip with photographers because they, they're not really strangers and they are so nice. And so my experience meeting photographers is I like them. Um, <laughs> so there is something about photography that attracts really good people. And, and I'm going to add one more thing. There's also a huge range of talents within the photography community. And I've met so many people. Uh, for an example, I went on a trip uh, a few years ago. I met a woman who was in her 80s. And all she shot with was an iPhone. Mm -hmm. And it was just amazing what she captured because she'd go out in the streets and she'd just see wonderful things that other people didn't even notice. And it was funny because her husband uh, had like thousands of dollars of, you know, mm -hmm. very intricate equipment. He was a fairly good photographer, but nowhere near as good as she was. That's so cool. I love it. Hey, Beth? Yeah? 
Uh, this is Jim Collymore call, um, talking. Um, I was wondering about your thoughts on age diversity in trying to uh, increase that social support group. Uh, have you found that more prevalent in social settings uh, abroad than in the U.S.? So in, in non-Western in non -Western countries, there is built-in social support in the way that those societies structure themselves. So there you do not see an age difference. Um, religions provide a lot of social support. Um, broader families, they have much larger groups of people. There's an expectation that you show up for things. And so in, in traditional cultures, you see a lot more social support as people get older. In the West, um, people get social support in college if they go to college or as young people, but then as they get older, our systems don't provide a continuing social support. Um, we're not as religious as we used to be. We, we don't have built in structural programs that encourage social support. And so what we're seeing in Western culture is that as people age and they lose touch with friends, they become lonelier and lonelier. And, and the older you are, the more at risk you are of losing your social support. And we need to consciously recognize that and make sure that we are always building our social networks and always you know, keeping a group around us, fostering those old friendships, working you know, on family relationships in order to maintain that support into uh, older age. The older you get in America, the more at risk you are of losing your social support. We don't value uh, older people in the way they do in a lot of other cultures. And we've even got, you know, people saying now, well, those old folks, maybe we ought to just sacrifice them uh, so we can get the economy restarted. I mean, that's, you know, among some people, that's how they think. So you would never find that kind of thinking in other cultures. And it's interesting because it makes, um, so it, if you study resilience across cultures, you'll see that um, a lot of Latin American countries are much more resilient than say European countries, it's really interesting. Um, rates of suicide are much higher in the West than in some um, developing countries. You have some countries where it's, it's really awful. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that you know, there are some African countries where the trauma they are experiencing is so grave that even some of these protective structures, they aren't protective enough. Um, so I think that's why you see Latin America because they're still doing better economically and, and it's not as awful as in some parts of the world. But some of the, you don't wanna lose those protective factors as you industrialize, as you grow economically, there has to be a way to carry those protective factors with you as you develop economically. And we can always go find them. I mean, all of this we can do right now. We don't have to wait. Um, we just have to recognize that maybe structurally we were discouraged from maintaining social support. Now we have to actively build it and you know, stay part of social groups in order to maintain our resilience. Beth, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, you know, will give the, you know, appearance of being highly resilient, you know, always looking positive, always, you know, on the game, always this, always that. But internally, mm -hmm. they're not. Yes. You know, and sometimes I find myself that way. Like when I'm home and alone, man, I'm down on myself. But when I'm amongst other people, I've got this, you know, other persona that's around there. How do you manage that? And how do you work that with the social support and these other five factors? So, you know, recognize that we're all doing that and recognize that it's okay to stop. It's okay to stop putting on a facade. I'm going to bring up my resources because some of these online resources address this um, question. I did not include Brene Brown, but she's the best at talking about vulnerability. If we're actually vulnerable in public and we take off the armor that we put on in public, we will have a greater positive impact on the people around us than you can ever imagine. Um, I, I stopped wearing the armor after I recovered from post-traumatic stress disorder. And I, would, I was a senior leader in the State Department at very senior levels. And I would tell people, you know, I was in therapy. 
And I would tell people, I'm, you know, I'm not doing so well today, especially after my parents passed away. I talked about how hard that was for me. When they can see your vulnerability, they see that you're a human being and they can relate to you. And honestly, they will respond to you so much more positively. You know, I see this with Prince Harry when he started talking about um, his mental health challenges and people were like, wow, he's a prince you know, and now he's being open about his challenges in life. And he's done more good for people in the United Kingdom since coming out about his own challenges. So the important thing is to take off your own armor, be your true authentic self. When you are modeling that behavior, you're encouraging others to do the same. You can't tell them they have to. People, you know, people will be more impacted by your behavior than your words. They will see how successful and happy you are and go, well, I want to be like you. And then they can take off their armor. And if we all just took off our armor, it would be great. A lot of us keep our armor on out of fear and that, okay, if I, if I take off my armor and that person doesn't, they're going to somehow harm me. You know, it's a weakness. They might hurt me. So I'm, we keep waiting for each other to take off the armor. Now nah, take off the armor. You, you'll, you'll be so happy you did. So we have like four minutes um, for additional questions. I do encourage you all to, to read my blog. It's the first line on the resources, but these other websites are also phenomenal. They talk about energy and resilience and how to bounce back and how to thrive. They're really good websites. And then we have like three minutes for questions or more thoughts and comments. I'm going to go out and shoot some photos. Yay. <laughs> Isn't this great? It not only gives you permission to photograph, it's saying photography is an essential part of your well-being that you must make time to photograph. You must spend money on it. You must spend time on it. You know, I, I'm, I'm an introvert at heart, uh, and I've kind of used this stay-at-home thing to, to justify me staying at home. <laughs> I think i got to turn that around a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, I'm an introvert at heart too, so I can relate. It's hard living in New York City though, I'm going out right now to do photography. You know, they're telling, we're, we're at an epicenter, we gotta stay home. Yeah. But so what I find I'm doing instead is going back to other photos I've taken and from photography classes, applying new things I've learned on the editing and stuff like that until I can take my camera and go back out again. That's fantastic. And explore your apartment or your home and see if you can photograph where you're living the way you would photograph a park, say, for example. Um, you know, really open your mind to, I'm going to, I'm a street photographer. So like, I'm going to walk the streets of my apartment and see what I can find just like I walked the streets of Havana. So try it out. Beth, can you, can you put your contact information on screen? Yes, I'll go back to the first slide. There you go. That's my email, my website, my LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Feel free to email me. Feel free to reach out. Now you've inspired me to write a blog about photography and resilience. I haven't written about it yet. And I, I hadn't actually put it together until Lauren asked me to do this. So I have to thank Lauren. Um, I've always thought about it and I've used examples in my training, but I've never like thought about how important photography has been to my own resilience and why. Oh, yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you because this has been fantastic. Um, it's funny, a couple of days ago, I, I, I always go out and use photography as meditation because I also cannot meditate. And I have a, a good friend who's been, you know, calling me regularly throughout this, you know, craziness and talking about like, you know, what she's trying to do to keep herself mentally stable. And I sent her like a slideshow and I called it my photo meditation. Oh. And, you know, I offered that up to her to kind of like keep her mind yeah. in a better place and I got a lot of comments also because I put it on Facebook I got a lot of comments on how it helped others too that's fantastic I think a lot of us are also signing up for Lauren's workshops because that's helping a lot <laughs> good well that's what I got on this whole thing is the more workshops you take the better off you're going to be is that, is that what you're saying Beth? absolutely just kidding plan the trip six months from now <laughs>
And I'd like to see if we could uh, do something that would bring in uh, younger photographers. Mm -hmm. Yes. I want to bring in older photographers. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Beth. This was great, uh, uh, better than I anticipated. So I really appreciate you taking the time to put this together and, and sharing your, your knowledge with everyone. It's, it's been great. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Beth. So much. Thank you, Beth. So, Thank so you. The video, the video will be posted Thank you. on Meetup. Yeah. It was awesome. Thank you. The video Thanks, will be posted Beth. on Meetup. It'll be posted on Beth's uh, website also and on my website. So uh, yeah. if you want to watch again or share it with others, please do. Definitely, Definitely share it. Thank you. Thank you. This Thank was great. Was great. Wonderful. I bet you, 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 you wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.